And these are this technique is amazing. Again, no strong assumption, very fast, ex exceptional. It uses this, this uh, tool called uh, RKHS. I put this slide together. Uh, it's, it's really busy, uh, and I'm sorry about it. But it's to say, why is there a kernel here introduced? So if you go, let's, look, let's go to the bottom, let's say. So x, y, again, the same. x is the bathymetry, y is the uh, tsunami wave height at the shore. And these random vectors, you know, you can associate to these random vectors these uh, kernels or covariance, uh, or covariance correlations, if you want. And how does it work? Uh, so this is um, what is a kernel, or uh, you know, uh, reproducing, reproducing kernel in the space. So if you have a kernel, it's uniquely associated with a, 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 a Hilbert, with a Hilbert space of functions. And these are actually, the last part maybe I should go, uh, they are evaluating uh, uh, kernels. They are, they, are, they are the evaluation function. So anyway, so the kernel function evaluated at, so with, with a functional argument here, for certain w belongs to this h. You take the linear hull of these functions, and then when you take a function in that space and you, and you take the inner product with one of these functions that you generate in the, in, in, through the k, through the kernel, it evaluates the function at the point omega. It's reproducing. <laughs> yes. Actually, if you put k again, that's why it's called reproducing. OK? So there are many. It's, it's a very active field also of research. It has uh, been uh, very popular in, uh, you know, uh, in the past uh, through smoothing, for example. Uh, Grace Barber has a, pay, a book on this, whatever. And it's, it's very active in machine learning. They, they love this. And that's why they come from machine learning, these people. Yeah? And OK, fine. So if you have these two functions, you can, you can associate a RKHS. Or you start with a kernel, actually. But okay. Why am I doing this? Because the, what's driving all of this, and I will go back to uh, the notion of active space that uh, Constantine has introduced. What are you doing? You want to reduce the dimensional, the dimensional of the input. So you want to see what inputs are influential on the outputs. So you want to see, you want to examine sensitivity, right? So when, when, when strategy is what Constantine has done, uh, and we follow kind of that, is to uh, look for uh, gradients, right? You look for the gradient of the answer, I mean, of y, uh, with, with respect to x, okay? Except that these people have done something more statistical. Because the gradients, you can, you can find them explicitly uh, in Constantine's examples for elliptic PDEs, for example. But if you, to compute gradients is very costly, typically. And yeah, actually, you talked about this, uh, Omar, I think. So these people uh, uh, don't, don't look at, this, uh, at PDEs or anything. They're just statisticians or, or machine learners, sorry. And so you start with kernels uh, that are associated with those random variables. And then you try to compute these uh, derivatives, and you can do it for any j in this uh, abstract uh, Hilbert space. So you try to compute this conditional expectation, or the gradients of this conditional expectation. Is that helpful? That doesn't look very helpful, right? But it looks very theoretical and, and unhelpful. However, when you, when you um, deal with these uh, RKHS, you, you can actually, it, it boils down in the end to a problem where you only compute uh, inner products and, and, uh, and quantities based on the basis functions of your uh, RKHS. And if you have a well-behaved uh, kernel, let's say a Gaussian kernel, uh, they, they give you exam examples, you can actually compute those quantities, the gram matrix here. Or these gradient, these are the gradient vectors of the kx. So, gram matrix uh, on the basis, right? So, I'm not going to give you any information uh, beyond this, just saying that in the end, to, to compute these, you, you, you um, uh, end up first estimating a matrix. And this matrix is computable when you make choices about those kernels. So when you make choices that are appropriate about those kernels. It's many pages, it's complicated, there are theorems to back this up. But 
it's the idea. It's a, there's a MATLAB code of few lines <laughs> in the end <laughs> to, to solve this. So we compute this matrix, and the xi are, the, are given by the, uh, the sample that you start with, and, and y you know, is the, the original value, but these, G, these are gram matrices based upon the sample that you, are, you have in hand. You, comp you find the eigen decomposition of this matrix, and then you take the first, let's say, d eigenvalues. It looks like PCA a bit, if you are SVD, whatever, but it's not, and it's much more efficient. What do you do next? What? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Kind of, yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Um, yeah, you differentiate the kernel. You go for you go for the kernel. Yeah. Yes, that's much more. Actually, they have a, even a result on that. That if you have differentiable kernels, then the, the derivatives are actually computed using the differentials of the kernel, etc. So you're totally right. Yes, it's the sample size, the x i y i. It's not m. It's more. Let's say you can run the compute. My my models, I can run maybe up to 100 times, 500 times. I've done once, but I cannot afford more. And then, so you have a reduced space. Now you have this B. Sorry, I didn't say anything about B. B was this projection matrix, and you can you can tell. Well, let me take that first part, and and call it B. I would never get to my to, to the end of my talk, by the way. But I'm, I love it. It's much more interactive than. <laughs> but anyway, so you do that, and you can establish some results that depend on this spectral gap, whatever. These are quantities I'm not defining. But you build the emulator of this new, uh, let's say, simulator on this reduced space. So you build an emulator of f hat on this reduced space, right? On the low dimensional space. And in the end, you approximate f of x by f f tilde on the projection, right? So you go two steps. First, you reduce the dimensionality of the problem, and then you build the emulator on the reduced dimension. Well, there are many choices to be made, but that's another problem. So let's go back to something maybe you're more comfortable with. This is the typical problem of elliptic PD uh, Constantine in his paper on active sub subspace. Yes? Well, people have tried, yeah, I can, yeah. There are many techniques, induced points, or whatever, yes. Uh huh. Yes. Yes, you want to. Exactly, you want to find a basis on which to project, so you combine them, yeah. But you're right, there are many other techniques, huh? they're very good techniques, but this is more about the, it's more about emulation, so we are interested in the sensitivity, because people have fitted Gaussian process in, in, with different ideas in mind, like, uh, I, I don't want to talk too much about this, but maybe Omar, you have a question? Yes, yeah, not the same beta. Sorry, there's a beta. Th th this is literally uh, some quantity in uh, in this theorem that's not absolutely not related to that beta. Yes, yes. So, sorry, it's my. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, uh, no, we are interpolatory, unless we put uh, what's called a nugget. But what are, what are you talking about? I mean, uh, what's your story? Is it's, it's about the? Ah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, no, we don't have a stochastic, yeah, we don't assume that, but it's, but you could, I mean, Bobby Gramercy here is, is using that, that, that kind of technique, uh, actually. Uh, but um, no, we don't have a stochastic uh, computer model. But you could kind of introduce it in order to, actually, I'll show that in the next part if I get to it. Um, so this is the typical linear elliptic PD that solved the, uh, so A is uncertain, it's expanded on that basis here. And then uh, what we want to do here it's compared with the exact solution because here f and the gradients of f are available. And that's what uh, Constantine and all use are using in order to reduce the dimension of the problem. So we do that, but we, we, we don't compute the gradients, even though it's uh, p computable. We compute this uh, funny gradients and so on. And we compare with other methods. Anyway, so it's not good to show a table usually in a, in a in a talk, but uh, this is the active subspace method. That's the best, and it should be the best because it's exact in terms of finding the gradients, where, where we, whereas we estimate those gradients. This is using the full, not even dimension reduction. Here it's possible, it's a bit lengthy. We vary a bit, a few things. The dimension of the projection from, uh, I guess, 100 dimension. It's 100 dimension to five, or up to five. It kind of were okay, uh, but the other methods sometimes suffer, sometimes do well, but not that well. This is with different length scale, and uh, again, depending on the technique, we we kind of do well. We we do well actually, and this is the computational time. So if you compute the gradients uh, um, numerically, obviously you spend time on it. Oh, th th these techniques vary a little bit. This has a bit of an additional cost, obviously, the full. It's still less costly than computing gradients. But our motivation was not to tackle the problem of ellipt elliptic PDs, because they do fine. We, no, our motivation is to tackle the problem of uh, hyperbolic or you know, PDs where you cannot compute the gradients. So uh, the case of uh, nonlinear shallow water equations is exactly that. Right? So we couldn't access the gradients. Uh, or if you compute them, OK, whatever, we can access. So what did we do here, a little toy problem? We deform uh, the seabed. This is the, the earthquake happening here that deforms the seabed. Uh, this is very simple. We didn't use Okada or anything. We do that uh, realistically in other papers, but not here. And then we assume that over, over this near shore uh, region, we, we're uncertain about the bathymetry. And, and this is a zoom from that location, and we put some uh, virtual gauges at shore, offshore. And we sample some tracks. <laughs> According to the length, uh, let's say for a specific budget, either you can be rich or poor and you sample the bathymetry accordingly. And therefore, if you have information about the bathymetry in that square, then you can infer what is the, un the mean and the uncertainty about this, uh, uh, this bathymetry. These plots are not very interesting to look at, obviously, but uh, at what, you, what you can look at is this difference in scale here for the standard deviation of the a different level. And then we propagate these uncertainties uh, through this model called Volna, uh, similar to uh, GeoClo, very similar actually, except that it's not IMR, it's uh, unstructured meshes. And we used to run it on Emerald that died, and now we use it in, uh, on these two machines at Oxford and Cambridge, actually. Mike Joyce has uh, obtained funding for this, it's very nice. And 3200 is our dimension of the bathymetry, and we propagate these, right? If we do that uh, without any emulation, we get this kind of plot. Uh, we're using either the true bathymetry or the mean bathymetry of the sample, or whatever. We get these results. Not, not so interesting. It's not what, what motivates us. What motivates us is to reduce dimension from 3,200 to, uh, we actually go, went to three. It's, uh, it's very, but why? Because it's symmetric as a problem. It's, and first, there's only one direction where, where it's really changing. It's, it's, and second, you would expect three, four, five modes of variability in the near shore bathymetry to have an influence on the uh, on, on the wave. It's called a bathymetry, bathymetry signature. It, it's it's fine. I mean, we optimize that too. Huh? So we do cross validation. We do ma many things like that. So we reduce the dimension of, uh, dimension of the input consisting of bathymetry, but we don't reduce h. It's one value. It's, it's totally fine. Now we cannot compare with active subspace because it's not available. We cannot compare with other methods that's also uh, struggling in that setting where you cannot uh, access so many things. And these are similar methods to the ones be before. They're the kind of state of the art. 
I mean, this one is state of the art. This one is a bit older. Anyway, so we do sometimes better, on average better. On average better. What's nice also is that we can train. So how many samples of your computer model, or how many runs of your computer model do you need to uh, learn? And actually about 100 for 3,200. So that was a question raised uh, earlier this week. For this problem, it's really a problem dependent, obviously. Uh, that's what, and for this technique, uh, that's what we obtained. So we were quite happy because we can afford 100, maybe 150, 200, that's it. I mean, obviously, we change. And that's the last slide of that part. What is the consequence on these gauges, on these locations that are offshore? Not so much difference between, uh, this is uh, in uh, orange, it's assuming the true bathymetry. And varying the bathymetry is, uh, has an influence near shore or at shore. You can see the huge difference it, it, it triggers here. It spreads the uncertainty quite a bit. Huh? We, here it's a toy problem. We know the bathymetry. We know. We, create, we created it, this bathymetry. This is our invention. So it's a toy problem. Uh, no, this was not, uh, this was not random. We, we, we have a function, an explicit function that generates this. We created also these little bumps and so on. We, we did many things to get to something that's kind of realistic. And then, and then we assume that we don't know it and we sample with this boat tracks, we sample here. And it, it's actually, this is a view obviously that's uh, from the side, but we have uh, a plain view as well. So that's the, you know, that's actually a worry because uh, let's say in India where I work now, the bathymetry in the shore is not well known in many places, by the way. Uh, you have hydrographic maps, uh, you know, for boats to move around, but that's it, and it's not very precise. So the, con you know, you see, you expect a tsunami between two and four or five meters, but here at that location, and uh, this is not even a location where you have canyons where, where, where there's focusing of the wave. It's just a <laughs> regular place. Uh, you have this effect. So this is at shore, and this is then onshore, but deeper inshore. And it, then we know the topography very well, so this effect of the bathymetry kind of dies out. It's interesting. Um, but anyway, the, the point was mostly this technique of dimensional reductions. How do I switch from one to the other, like Alt-Tab? Uh, maybe... Uh, no, oops. So this one, and control L. Yes? <laughs> I, don't, I don't mind talking, but this, the organizers, the chair of the session may. Go ahead. Yes. Yes, yeah. You, you totally. And is the, so of course you can learn for that. You do. I don't know, but we did, we do it kind of not, not, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know the exact relationship, I don't know, it's a very good question, but um, I don't think there's much of a, uh, much, it's not so much, because you do it first, um, because you build the emulator after when you, but it has an influence, obviously, but, but we found it quite robust. Actually, this technique is quite robust. Uh, we, you know, we tried different kernels. They, they show that in their papers too. Uh, you know, it's just uh, strong. The matrix B, sorry. Actually, you. I feel ashamed. We should have done that. This is absolutely essential because what I was saying about the bathymetry signature, the influence of, that's the next step. Actually, we're going to do that in practice. Sorry. One matrix per gauge. One matrix per gauge. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, your, 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 uh, uh, variation in the uncertainty in the bathymetry. Where is it located for that particular, uh, quantity of interest? That's another story. The Earth is moving. This, uh, yeah, the combination of the two. I, this, it's infinite. Yeah. Uh, we, we're going to do that for Sumatra 2004. We, we, with my current postdoc, we 
we worked on Sumatra 2004 already. We, we did a paper on the uncertainties that is hopefully uh, okay, but we didn't do that. We are going to do that next. Smaller design, then I can squeeze that. <laughs> I have much more to say because I have also surrogate-based optimization for the data simulation. So I, I don't know. What, I started late, but still, like, okay, I continue. So experimental design. So this X, I, Y, I that we, we pick, how do we pick them, right? So you, in the, the more standard uh, literature of, uh, you know, applied mathematics, you do all these, uh, some of you have shown these uh, designs. That, uh, you call them sam samples. You call them, you know, sparse, in sparse grid or whatever. But, uh, in, in statistics, uh, or you showed, uh, some of you showed Latin hypercubes. So we, we, we can, there are many techniques and, uh, to, to do that. There's actually an alphabet soup of designs, A, B, C, E, D, whatever. But, you know, Latin hypercube is uh, satisfying for, uh, for computer models. This is an example of Latin hypercube that tries to misalign points and explore the input space. But uh, with my postdoc, uh, Joaquim, we wanted to work on sequential design. So uh, instead of uh, uh, you know, throwing points like this uh, in a one snapshot and then run the computer model, it's maybe smarter uh, to learn along the way and th therefore spend less time computing, right? To, to, just sample, to just exercise the model, exercise. And where should we go next? That's the question. So ALM is the kind of the basic method. I'll, t I'll, dis I'll explain in, in details. So you start with points, let's say, in the middle, and then you, 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 you go next somewhere. And you can see here, that these are very simple examples or illustrations of what's happening. It puts a lot of points on the boundary. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually a waste of information. But what does it do? It looks for the variance. It's a variance-based uh, criterion. So, it, oh, obviously high variance uh, on the corners, on the sides, right? You don't know that. You remember my plot where we have the extrapolation? That's what it does. ALC is a bit smarter. It's much smarter. So that's uh, Bobby Gramercy's work. Uh, the nice papers, nice uh, software also. That looks at, uh, by adding a point, uh, how much do you reduce the variance, which is different from where is the variance high. And uh, mutual information, that's not our invention at all, obviously. It's, uh, it was there in the literature, and these people in, uh, I mean, in computer science in Zurich, uh, Andreas Krauss has introduced this. But we tailored that to the computer experiments uh, problem. It gives, it gives a uh, similar design, a bit, a bit more compact maybe, but it's faster to compute. 